Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on our show, I am pleased to introduce you to Professor Jeremy Kagan. Jeremy is a director, writer, and producer of feature films and television shows. His films include Heroes, The Big Fix, The Chosen, and The Journey of Natty Gann. He has also directed popular television series including The West Wing and Chicago Hope, for which he received a Primetime Directing Emmy Award, and he directed and produced the 10-part series Freedom Files. He has served as the artistic director of Robert Redford's Sundance Institute and is the chairperson of special projects of special projects for the Directors Guild of America, which provides educational, cultural, and technological information and events for its 15,000 members. Jeremy has taught master seminars on filmmaking in France, Germany, Hong Kong, India, Ireland, Israel, Lebanon, and Vietnam. But why is he here on our show today? Well, it's to talk about his near-death experience, which led him to write and illustrate with 200 paintings his ebook, published by Balboa Press called My Death, A Personal Guidebook. You can find out more about him at www.theneardeathandlifeofjeremykagan.com. So with warm welcome, Professor Jeremy Kagan, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Glad to be here. Thanks for taking the time to have a conversation. Oh, but of course, I'm thrilled to meet you, especially after watching some of your movies and television series. I think it's a big honor to be here with you today. Glad, glad we're all here. No, oh, yeah, me too. How, uh, you're in California, I'm imagining, close to the Hollywood area. Actually, not the Hollywood area. I live in an area called Venice, which is uh, right actually near the, the water. So uh, Holly, nice. Hollywood is somewhere behind me at this moment. Yes, I've been to Venice Beach. That's close that's, to where you are. That's correct. That's, that's the neighborhood right here. Very nice. Very, very nice area. So, uh, you know, I have an image of you being a California guy and uh, working in movies and things like that. Would you just, uh, just share a little bit about how you, maybe you got involved in that industry and then uh, if you could move into, you know, what happened that you attended. Well, I know your story, so I won't give it away. Uh, those things that happened that led to your near-death experience. Well, I'm an East Coast guy, not a California guy. Oh, okay. Um, fact, it took me a good 10 years to even adjust to Los Angeles. Um, I came out here because I had gone to graduate school uh, where I studied uh, film and television, actually at uh, NYU. Um, and then I got a, a grant to a place called the American Film Institute, which was um, new at the time. And it was, in fact, here, in, actually in an old mansion called the Doheny Mansion, kind of a haunted mansion, actually, wow. um, in uh, Beverly Hills. And there were 12 people that were chosen to be part of this, and that brought me to California. Um, also exposed me some brilliant young filmmakers at the time, people who went on to have quite wonderful careers like Terry Malick and David Lynch. Um, and um, that sort of uh, was the beginnings of the entrance into um, working on the West Coast and living on the West Coast. And at the time, um, the Hollywood machinery didn't quite know how to deal with some hits like American Graffiti and another movie called Easy Rider. Mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, thought to be sort of like drive-in type movies, but they were so successful that they really needed to find young people who could address supposedly the new young audience that they didn't quite understand. And so a lot of us got opportunities that were quite rare. Um, and that's what led my getting into the world of, uh, of um, motion pictures and started in television and moved into motion pictures just in terms of my career. But, um, you know, I sort of always have felt, and still do actually, although I love living in uh, Venice, and uh, despite the climate changes, uh, we're still a, a very pleasant environment to, uh, right. to be in. And so uh, uh, I've enjoyed now much more the advantages of actually uh, West Coast living, and I must say Los Angeles over the years has shifted in terms of even its culture. It's become quite an art center, yes. separate from a business center um, right. for making movies. So for me, um, 
I still think of myself as uh, as a uh, bi-coastal being because I grew up in the East Coast. I also grew up um, in relationship to the subject that we're going to really talk about. I mean, obviously, I can talk a lot about movie making, but that's really not our our, our subject. Although I must say, I, I do want to mention that I am actually involved in making a movie right now that does have some references to this subject as well. This movie is called Shot. It's about what happens to three people as a consequence of one bullet. Um, this is a feature film that hopefully will be out in the theaters within the next six months to deal with the issues of uh, gun violence in America and, of course, the issues of what happens when somebody uh, goes through these incredible sort of tragic transformations when some kind of violence enters their lives. So we're dealing with a similar thing about the is uh, uh, when this is a particularly a piece uh, confronting the issues of both mortality and redemption. Um, um, so my mind at this moment, as you can imagine, since I'm right now in the editing room, we've already shot the movie. It uh, stars a young 16-year-old kid and, and, and Noah Wiley, who gives an amazing performance. And uh, So uh, sort of where my head is at is in the midst of that, because my dear, I'm sort of even taking an interruption here from editing to have this conversation. But uh, I want to reference where I come from because I think that that may um, somehow speak to anyone who's listening to this about, about where they come from because I um, uh, grew up in the East Coast and my father was a clergyman. Um, so you'd think that the issues of spirituality would have been something that would have been discussed in the home, but he was a very sort of socially responsible clergyman. He believed that his, his goal was to get his congregants to realize their interconnect in this with others that were not part of the community and their responsibility to help others need. And that was, was really the, 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 the pulpit that he spoke from. Um, I remember that when uh, I was young, the civil rights movement was happening and he joined many other clergymen to go down south to uh, help uh, uh, others um, sort of emerge from the oppression of the particular societies that they were living in. And this was the sort of, this social responsibility was very much what the theme is when my, uh, in my household when I was young. So the idea of the of a sort of an, uh, a, a spirit as part of who you were or a soul, that surprisingly enough was not part of the conversation. The conversation was really what is your responsibility here as a human being to other human beings. So I didn't know anything about sort of the idea of either both the spirit or soul as part of my growing up. But when I was um, making a particular movie called The Chosen from a very popular book uh, by, written by Chaim Potek, um, I got exposed to a world that I knew nothing about, which was this ultra-Orthodox Jewish Hasidic world in Brooklyn at the time, and because the story involves a young boy who grows up within that world and another boy who uh, he becomes friends with who is from a different world and the relationship between these two boys. And in order to, to sort of find out what I was talking about, I began to go to homes and spend time with the people from this particular background. And this world is a world that really looks at you, you as a human being as, in essence, a soul that is within a body. Mm -hmm. um, as distinguished from sometimes we, we think of ourselves as, okay, we have our body, we have our feelings, we have our senses, and somewhere in there, there might be a soul. Right. You know, right. And maybe, maybe we'll find it one day if we meditate for a long time, or maybe if a psychotropic is taken, or somehow we're struck by a lightning, we'll, oh, there's the soul for half a second. Mm -hmm. Um, their concept is very different. It is that, in fact, that is who you are. You are a soul, and you are connected to the ultimate and the, and the unknown to God in some fashion or other. And it, that part of, of this sort of powerful everythingness has now become specifically implanted in a particular body. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's a wonderful uh, teaching of Ram Dass. He said one of the days is that, you know, two people looking at each other and you suddenly look at someone saying, are you in there? Meaning, uh, my soul's in here. Is your soul in there? Because it's like the, the, the personalities we have are almost like these spacesuits we wear. And that's what we see and that's how we deal with each other. And we bump into each other. Right. But inside the spacesuit is this other sort of, the, uh, mixing lots of uh, religious cultural ideas, but the sort of the Atman or the Nishoma, which is one of these words, so is this this essential beingness that is both eternal, unlimited, and um, uh, you know, uh, abundant beyond be belief and extending beyond all all limitations. That that in fact is who you are. 
But, you know, most of our lives, and particularly in my life, I didn't know this. This is not part of my consciousness. So my thought, and I think I grew up with this, maybe others who were listening grew up with this, is, you know, when, when somebody dies, they die. Mm-hmm. In fact, I even remember there was a phrase that, that was said within the, uh, um, that my father would say, and I think it was written in some of the texts, and you are, um, you, your life goes on in the memory of those who cherish you. Right. So in a sense, okay, our memories of the people who we know died, uh, th- that's where those people, quote, live. But, mm-hmm. of course, they're dead. You know, when that body dies, then they die. Now, again, this is the way I grew up. So I didn't start with this idea, oh, that you have a soul and that soul may move on or that soul may return or whatever phrases that one has or one might believe in. I had none of this, you know. Mm-hmm. Death was the end. Okay, done, fine, that was the end. And th- so uh, now I'm... It, you know, out here in Los Angeles, and I'm, I'm very busy working as a film director, and and um, enjoying the, both the work and taking a lot of times of the kind of work I'm doing is social responsible filmmaking, pushing Hollywood's envelope in terms of that, and, and having some good successes. And I, I, um, one of my acquaintances on a project that I was uh, going to get involved with um, turned out to be someone who was much more aware of different kind of spiritual encounters. And I liked him, younger guy, and he, you know, exposed me to some number of things. And one of them was, because uh, he was getting training um, to be able to help lead, was what's called sweat lodges. Mm-hmm. Ever heard of the phrase before? I, I have. I've never attended, but I've heard of them. And I just, you know, I didn't know what a sweat lodge was, but, you know, I was, I was like, okay, what is it? And it's this Native American tradition, but it's actually a worldwide tradition. They, they do them in China and Mongolia and in, in, in various African cultures. It's, it's sort of like been around for, I guess, thousands and thousands of years. And the concept is you go into a space that's very dark and it's very hot. And in that space, you kind of go through a purification ritual because the heat is so intense and the darkness is there. And then you, you have an intention of literally opening up yourself to being both honest and sort of, sort of purifying yourself. And that's the concept. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and um, the Lakota, which to some people, you know, the, the, we, we sort of know them from the Western movies as the Sioux, but they're actually called the Lakota, uh-huh. um, have a great tradition of doing this. And who are willing over the last, I guess, 30 or 40 years to allow um, people who are not part of their the culture and tradition to experience these sweat lodges. So um, I did it a couple times. I did a men's weekend once where it opened up with a sweat lodge and then, you know, there's men for t- the two days, you know, confronting each other and sharing with each other and it ended with a sweat lodge. And I found these things to be very, very powerful because they were totally unlike anything I'd ever done. I don't particularly like to go in these places. They're really hot. I don't particularly oh, sure. like sweat. It's very uncomfortable. But at the same time, there's kind of an openness. Uh, in, the, in this particular tradition, they had four ch- uh, sort of sections to it. In the, in, in the first one, you, 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 you m- did prayers for yourself. But if you prayed so you, for your own health, it, it would go around in the circle of the darkness. The person next to you, even though he or she might want to have their health as well, by saying it out loud, you in essence were saying it for everybody. So if I say, you know, I pray that my health is good, that really means everybody Mm-hmm. is having that same prayer. And then there's a section called the uh, prayer for others, in which, you, you know, if you have people who need help, you might make prayers for them. A third section that um, is a giveaway section, very difficult. What are you willing to let go of? What are you willing to give away? You know, very, very hard to do, because huh? most of us, or at least like me, I'm, you know, I want to hold on to everything. Absolutely. But it's a, it's a, you know, part of the session. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll give away my need to, to be um, famous, or I'll give away my need to, to be rich, or I'll give me the need, need to have everybody pay attention, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Something that you're willing to sort of let go. And of course, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, when you let go of something, it makes space for something else to come in. And then a fourth section was a silent. So, very powerful experiences. I did three or four or five of these over a number of years. And it was in December, it was, the, it was actually the day before my birthday. And I decided, ooh, you know, there's a sweat lodge that day. I think I'll do that as a beginning of this, this experience of, 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 the, of this new year for me. Um, it would be a good way to open up mm-hmm. and cleanse myself. So, I went up into the Malibu Hills where this particular sweat lodge was being led and, and uh, went through the rituals of all of this. 
Um, and then, uh, but it wasn't as meaningful as some others had been, because some other some others had actually kind of sort of saw visions in the darkness that were very powerful and, and memorable and, and and effective in terms of reflecting who I was. But here I was, you know, coming out of this particular sweat bondage experience, you know, and it was very cold outside, and of course extremely hot inside. And as I exited the sweat bondage. I suddenly uh, couldn't control my balance. Uh, I sort of fell to the ground. And um, I, I thought, oh, well, it, it must be just you know, the heat and the cold, and I'll be fine. I'll just take a couple of breaths, and I'll be able to sort of get myself back into, into um, um, this regular consciousness. And, but uh, within a number of the moments, I suddenly realized, instead of returning to capacities of my physical capacities, I began to realize I could was losing them. I couldn't move anything in my body. I couldn't move my hands. I couldn't move my legs. I was lying down. I could feel still something. I could feel the, the ground. Um, but I was also feeling like everything was numbing up. My, I realized I was losing my vision, and I was also losing my hearing. So, of course, I became very, very scared. Of course. Oh, because I thought, oh, there's something really wrong. And I was, this was a Sunday. I was supposed to be at 20th Century Fox the next day directing a picture that I was working on. And I thought, mm, I'm, I'm in trouble here. They're going to have to call some paramedics. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going right. to be in any shape tomorrow to be in any, you know, I'm going to be in a hospital somewhere. So I was going through this, you know, obviously real fear because my all of a sudden all my body functions, all my senses were turned off. I, my throat became extremely dry, even kind of gravelly. Um, I was not aware of my breath, but I was definitely aware that something was really desperately wrong. Um, so uh, and I thought, okay, um, you know, this is going to, you know, this will still go away, but it didn't go away. Um, and the leader of the sweat, I remember leaning over, and I think, because sometimes people have reactions to these things that are very emotional, and, and then and they have to restore themselves, and I think he came over and sort of whispered, I think I vaguely heard this distant whisper, don't worry, nobody's ever died at any of my sweats, I hear this phrase, and so, but of course, I'm beginning to worry a lot. Sure. And um, the next thing I realize is, since I, I'm in physical total disability, I'm also not able to communicate. In other words, you know, they're going to, paramedics will come, they'll take me away, but I'll be put somewhere. But I can't see, I can't hear, I can't move. That means my family coming to see me, I won't know they're there. They won't know. I, I, I suddenly was losing all relationship, all capacity to be with people who are cared about or cared about me. That was gone if I didn't return here to, to the normal state. Mm -hmm. uh, doubly deadly fear. And so I, the first thing was letting go of my body and letting go of my sort of career. Next, I'm letting go of my family and all my relationships. But then I began to wonder, is this more serious? Am I actually, in fact, dying? Wow. I've lost all capacities of feeling and all capacities of communicating. Couldn't see, couldn't hear, couldn't move. Was this the beginning of my death? The first time I'd ever really considered, I mean, I'd had run-ins, you know, like so we all do, where, you know, oh boy, I was lucky that, mm -hmm. that car accident turned, didn't turn into a bad car accident or that, that, that boat turning over and being, you know, I didn't drown. I mean, they're close calls, we've all had them. But this was worse than a close call. So I'd be, I, I, my mind was still functioning. So I thought, well, maybe I, I can hold on to my life somehow in the interior of my being, I could, like holding your breath, mm -hmm. hold on. So I desperately tried to do that. I tried to, in fact, hold on. It's like, okay, I'm not going to let this, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to let this happen, I'm going to just hold on, I'm just going to hold on, even though I can't feel or move or anything, that interiorly I'm aware of myself, I'm aware of my being, and I'll hold on to this life right now, just hold on, hold on. Well, inevitably, like trying to hold your breath, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't hold on. And I literally let go. But this letting go was experienced. And it was the most blissful, 
serene, fluid perfection of sort of a kind of like a, like a, um, a warmth that just extended in every direction mm. and a peacefulness that was so beautiful and richly calm. Well, if that's what death is, wow, who could want anything more? This was one of the greatest, in quote, feelings I'd ever had. And then I realized I was aware of this experience that I was having that was purely the most transformatively perfect experience I'd ever had. And by the way, even as I'm talking to this today, and you know, before and up to now. Mm, wow. But I was also conscious. I was aware. And by being aware in this perfect, fluid ease and, 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 and tranquility, I asked myself a question. What happens next? Mm -hmm. Now, my mind, obviously, was still my mind. I was still who I am. Right. Even though my body was gone in essence, at least in this, this way. And asking that question, what's next? What occurred, like the mind does, was alternatives. Now, some of you listeners, I'm sure, grew up with the idea of heaven and hell. Even though my father was a clergyman, he actually did not believe in a heaven or hell. Interesting. He thought those were merely creations of institutions, oftentimes creations to make people afraid mm -hmm. so that they would, in fact, follow orders of institutions. And that, in his mind, I think, that when one died, one died. That was the end. So, therefore, one had, didn't have to worry about heaven or hell. You had to worry about what you did in this world, in this life. That was where your concentration, then that's where you needed to focus your energy. But I, you know, grew up, I read, you know, classic novels in colleges and, 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 and heard about and seen the paintings and images of heaven and hell. And so I asked myself, gee, what if there is a heaven? What if there is a hell? And immediately judging myself, which was easy to do, I thought, well, I'm probably going <laughs> to. <laughs> oh, the minute no. I thought about that, I went to my own version of hell. I went to my own version of hell and I it was terrifying and horrific and I couldn't believe it, it was disgusting and repulsive and revolting but there was suddenly an awareness there was an awareness that it wasn't real I mean yeah I was in this horrendous space and place but it was like being in a movie, it was, you know, you believe it's real or putting on VR glasses, if any of your, your, your listeners know what I'm talking about. You know, it's 360 degrees and it feels very real, but it's not. It's just a bunch of sound and images that are made up. And when I realized that, that this, quote, hell of mine was just an illusion, it was gone. It just, well, it just, it, it disappeared. When I realized it was, I, it, it, it was only something that I could believe in, but it was real. Yeah. Exactly. And at that moment, I began what later on I learned was a classic near death, and I kind of like the word through death, I think it's a better phrase, experience, mm -hmm. in which I was now moving in a sense, I had the sense of moving. Um, through a very sort of cloudy uh, environment, feel felt like I was going sort of vertical in the sense of there was a sense of direction. As I looked to my left and right, which I could do, um, I saw distant images, like kind of like they were like pillar-like things that were cloudy, that seemed to be were these people I knew, were these my ancestors. Mm -hmm. It was no real conversation, and some other people have had much more sort of verbal conversation. But they were they were sort of they were they were sort of ghost like images that were very cloudy, and and they they seemed to suggest beings, but I didn't really know who they were. And I kept moving, and I was 
moving toward, and I didn't know what this was, but I sort of felt I was moving toward what I would say is a star field. Hmm. And three days after the experience, there was a memory of something that I didn't realize until three days afterwards. Because as I was on this journey, and there was a sense of perfection and grace. Fear was gone. There was also a transcendence of negative and positive. It was like everything was one thing. You know, right and wrong had already disappeared. That was just not part of the, the space, the consciousness that I was in. It was way beyond that. And then there was this explosion. And it was an explosion in which everything I'd ever, and this is me, everything I'd ever heard, read, seen, experienced, all was happening in its entirety simultaneously in one millisecond. It was almost as if the history of me and the history that I knew of the world Every movie, every television show, every sound, every music piece, every person, every experience, all happened at the exact same time, all simultaneously. Wow. And there was a realization that this entire experience was itself a created thing. It wasn't real either. Mm. It was... You know, it's like, there's a, I'm sure some of your listeners know this, this image. It's like when you have a projector mm-hmm. and there's light coming through the projector and then you put a piece of film in front of the projector and it projects onto the screen an image. Right. And what you think is the image you see on the screen is what's real. But what's truly real is the light itself. And what I got was that all of the images, all of my experience, my entire existence, everything that I knew, was all made up. It was an illusion. And where I was on this journey in experiencing this perfect serenity and tranquility was I was getting back literally, or maybe figuratively, to the source of all, which is in a way, light. So there was this feeling that I was about to become part of the light. And like stars are, and gazillions of stars, each one of them is part of, if you will, the light. Mm -hmm. There are little specks of it. And that's where I was headed in this perfect, joyful, hard word to use because that sounds like there's bad and good. This is beyond bad and good. It was this serene perfection wow. and then as i was experiencing this beyond i was no longer jeremy i was no longer any of the experiences was i was just becoming the source of experience the light itself a star i lost consciousness in other words at that moment my awareness ceased. It's almost as if I became the source of awareness and therefore no longer was even aware. Hmm. And then like turning a movie backwards in reverse, where everything, because what happened is when I said, the, 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 uh, I'm leaning out the, sort of this one moment where I'm looking or being with the infinite sky of the you know, billions of, 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 of universes and stars, all of a sudden these all contracted as if the entire universe in its endless expansiveness and it's in its all of its lights and all of the, the, the you know, you know the, star systems all suddenly contracted into nothingness. And at that moment when that nothingness was was experienced, that was the ceasing of any consciousness on, I don't want to say my part, just any consciousness. Mm -hmm. But then it went in reverse and nothingness became everything. 
And then like a like a sort of a rocket ship in reverse, I went through the star systems and the planetary systems and and the constellations and came zooming back into Earth and into uh, you know, the, the, the American continent and into the California coast and into the area called Malibu and into this space where there was this body and that body into that body. And then I began to literally in, infuse that body and began to sort of come back into my physical sense consciousness. And and I was like a little baby. I was like moving like on all fours. I couldn't stand up. I could only sort of crawl. I couldn't really speak yet. I could hardly even move. But I began to sort of come back into who I am. So that's the journey. Uh, incredible. When you painted the picture of the film and the light shining through the film, it, it is just an incredible visual and I really got it. That we are the light. That was, that's great. Yeah. Yep, wow. Yep. The challenge, of course, is you know, when you have an experience like this, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that for some people, I think their lives literally have changed. They, whatever they used to do, what work they used to have, or whatever else, they've you know, chosen other work. I can't say that that happened to me. Because it didn't. Um, I continue, you know, I did show up on the set the mm -hmm. next day and was directing the picture that I was working on. But what I realize is that I've been given a gift and sometimes that gift is in front of me and I see that we're all on the same journey together, that each one of us is a player in this spectacular theater called Life. Um, and then we have responsibilities because it's an incredible gift to have this life um, and to cherish it and to help preserve it and to help others um, be able to take the joys that are right here in our physical existences. I mean, I get that that's really sort of why we're here, um, to contribute. Um, I also get that there's, I know, I, for a while, I would go see these various uh, uh, people who um, were um, sort of experts in this field because I started to research and tried to meet people to, to sort of ask, you know, what, did, what is this? You know, what happened? What, what, what should I learn from it? Because I was really like, I had no idea what this was and I wanted to know. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I met a whole bunch of people who had had either these kind of experiences or had knowledge about how to speak to this. And so there was this one particular person that I finally met, and, and he kind of started with laughing at me. And he said to me, you know, what you should do is you should meditate on a feather. Interesting. I go, what? Uh -huh. I just had this incredible through-death experience. You're telling me to meditate on a feather? What does that mean? All right. Oh, I was thinking, okay, meditate on a feather. You know, what's what's going to be meditating on a feather? I have no idea how I'm going to do that. But I'm thinking, okay, you know, um, I'll try. But at that time, I didn't know how to meditate took me many, many years later to be able to learn, and I'm still sort of learning that. Mm -hmm. But I thought about, I thought about, I concentrated. What is a feather? Well, it's this, you know, this thing that allows for flight, and, and it's, you know, and then I found out, and I studied what feathers are made of, and they're sort of like fingernails that are hollow, and there's you know, more air than not air, and, you know, just how they've been used by people. I go, this whole thing. And the guy is sort of watching me sort of think about this, and he finally looks at me, and he says to me, Lighten up. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> Lighten up. Mm -hmm. Now, when he said it to me, I realized, you know, I think he was sort of telling, telling me in one way, you're taking things so seriously. You know, you, you, you really do need to, to step back and, and not be so you know, overwhelmed by, um, by both this experience and, and and sort of you know, get to a place where 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 you can truly appreciate you know what's in front of you and but and, and then I was thinking about what lighten up really really sort of means when you say something like that because you know it means you know, get rid of some of the garbage that's in your life you know um, yes and, it does you know just it it, it means. It means, you know, stop taking everything so seriously and personally, you know? Right. 
how about just lose some weight? You know, lighten up. Um, you know, <laughs> literally the weight that sometimes drags us down, that weight of the past, that's a sense of guilt, that sense of, you know, uh, heaviness that oftentimes makes our, our lives you know, so difficult when, in fact, just getting up is a miracle in itself, you know, and, you know, lighten up, liberate the heart, you know, um, get rid of, you know, get, be free to sort of fly in the sense of not being limited by, by the baggage of your past, you know? or lighten up, become, you know, a light, literally, sort of a, you know, be a, a way uh, a, in your own life that can show other people how to live life fully and, and enjoy the gift of life, you know. Be passionate. That's to lighten up. Lighten up sure. like a fire, you know. Um, and uh, so so that's something that I need to remind myself. I'm glad I'm saying it out loud again today because, you know, being in the middle of editing this movie and all mm -hmm. the challenges of making a movie, and particularly a movie about such a serious subject, which is gun violence in our country, you know, I can get pretty serious. Of course. To remind myself to lighten up even in this process um, in terms of, uh, of who I am and how I work and how I am with other people. So that is a, is a reminder a lesson for me from this experience to lighten up. Mm. Did you have any experiences of love when you had your through death experience or after when you saw people? Yes, I did. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said because when I came back into sort of my physical capacities, when I returned to being Jeremy, to being who I am, I looked around and there were still some people there and I felt such flowing love toward everybody and everything. Um, I love the sky. I love the cold. I love the fire that was there. I love the ground and the earth that I was on. I love the capacity to see. I loved every one of the human beings that was around me. I, they all radiated energy. I just felt such openness. And, and, and if, you know, it, it's always difficult to, for some words. So how do you define love? What does love mean? But one of the parts of loving or was this this active sort of openness. It was just this joyful delight that other beings were here and a and a sort of wonderment uh, that that we're all here. Um, and that 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 non-judgmental like i'm looking at sort of a negative part of this the non-judgmental look at being because you know i have a mind maybe we all do where you know oh is this right is this good and we all have a reptilian you know brain that is worried about you know is this going to be good for us or bad for us right for the experience and then we're always making those judgments all the time every single second this was that reptilian brain was gone this was pure delight uh, in the very beingness of everybody and any, anybody and everything. Uh, and it was very powerful and lasted for a number of days. Um, as I, you know, went on to the, the set, I remember still having this, you know, feeling of, of just delight in all the people that were working with us and... But, you know, soon enough, you know, the, the core normalcies of uh, judgment, you know, returned. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a, it was a wonderful preacher uh, I once heard. Um, he was an African preacher, and he said to all of us in this particular congregation, close your eyes and remember a time when you felt love. Could have been with a parent, could have been with your dog, could have been with a friend, could have been with a lover, but just remember that time. Mm -hmm. And create for yourself in your mind what it looked like, what it smelled like, what it, what it felt like, whatever you can do to get to that space. I mean, and people were listening and there was some time taken. And you realize that you could get to that space. You could get to that, that you know, wonderful sense of of that experience of how you experience love. Now, you said, now maybe that person is no longer around. Maybe that, 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 that animal has died. Maybe mm -hmm. you moved on and from what that was a relationship. But you now 
you just experienced it and we're back there, which means that, that it is always available to you. You can always get back to the love that you had because it's within you. So that lesson of, you know, that you may be in turmoil, but you actually have a choice to go back to that memory that was real and bring it to your present. Um, that's very, that was a very powerful experience. I remember you know, having that, and as I have this conversation with you, it allows me to potentially remember that phenomenal feeling of absolute acceptance in, and delight in the existence of everything. And that was, I'd say, one definition of love for me. Mm, that's beautiful. There's a little exercise I, I give people, either their listeners or in my book, and it's when you have a conversation with somebody, they could be really crabby and in a bad mood. And if you get them talking about a time in their life uh, where they experience love, maybe it's the birth of their first child or getting married or whatever that is, you can see the person transform yep. into that love. And then yep. it's a whole new relationship you have with them. And then they live the rest of the, that day, you know, really in a whole different place. So that's, that's something wonderful. we can we can do it. And I'm thinking when you said joy and delight and wonderment, I was thinking about being a kid that everything was fascinating and fun and there's no fear on people. You know, you go just hug somebody or kiss them or play, want to play with everybody. And gosh, wouldn't that be nice to put that in being our adult selves and what kind of life that would be as opposed to one given by fear and, you know, all that guilt and all the Yep. baggage from our past oh, yep. good stuff. And, and, and it is as you said it is much baggage from our past and and it is a uh, fear you know I, I once heard i think this was a uh, krishnamurti who is a wonderful philosopher and um one of the things he, he was defining fear and he said it's actually based on two things that actually do not exist hmm. what are those two things well first it's always about the future that hasn't happened. Now that's true, isn't it? Right? Yeah. So though it hasn't happened, I'm afraid something bad is going to happen, and I'm in fear mode, right? Mm -hmm. But it hasn't happened. And the other thing is, and this is a, a bit more complex, is, and it's also the mind. And the mind itself is not, quote, real. Um, it too is an illusion because just as you showed, within a, a second, you can shift the mind's focus from one thing to another, meaning that it itself is not solid. It is, you know, fluid and changeable. So fear is based on, on a, a, a fluid, changeable you know, part of our neuro, neurological systems and it is about something that hasn't happened. So in a way, fear itself is an illusion. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't operate with it because we would all do. Of course. But um, to be able to, you know, on one level, and I guess this is, this is sort of an ideal level, if, if in fact the lesson of my experience was that the body itself may end, but consciousness does not, which is what I would say, you know, if I sort of summarize mm -hmm. the learning from this particular uh, um, uh, uh, through death experience that I had. Okay, consciousness never ends. Um, whereas, you know, I did say there was a moment of, of nothingness, but those people who sort of uh, either come from Buddhist traditions or, or even uh, you know, there's a Jewish tradition that's Kabbalistic that talks about something called the Ein Sof, which is sort of the nothingness that creates the everythingness. That nothingness that I experienced in a way was that. It's sort of the precursor before consciousness itself. But if we start from the nothing that, that then leads to consciousness and that consciousness then leads to form, which is, you know, the bodies and the senses and the beings that we're in at this particular moment, that when that form ends, consciousness doesn't. Consciousness is still going on. Um, and that's a big shift for me in the way I understand the world. You know, and we'll understand people, you know, when you meet certain or hear about certain people who sort of know what's going on 
in other people's brains mm -hmm. <laughs> or experiences, and you're saying, how do you know that? It's because they're working on a level of consciousness where everything is in the, on the field. Uh, you know? right. So it's, it's available for them. Now, maybe it's also available for us. I know that when I work with actors, this is, you know, this is one of the things that, 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 that we do with the actors is we help them find within themselves other parts of, of, of being that is not who they literally are. But they can bring that being into life, uh, into our present. So they're sort of going into that, if you will, field of consciousness that contains everything and locking in on, oh, I'm going to play this character and then bring that character, who, because all characters are in consciousness, all of them, bring that character and pull that character into you know, the particular role that they're playing. So that's a shift. That's a, and, and then the question is, how can we be aware, in, particularly in times of struggle, mm -hmm that we are not just the person in that struggle that we that struggle's real but we are more than that right i love what you just said about acting because i'm thinking about fear and when you have something that comes up that hasn't happened yet but it's taking over your mind and you're so fearful if we could uh, quiet our minds and tap into like an actor does that part of ourselves that either has gotten through it or can do anything or our superhero selves. I just think that would totally change the outcome and actually who we're being in being courageous. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, and, 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 and added to that, there's um, something we've been, uh, I, I teach at the school of cinematic arts at the university of Southern California. And um, one of the things is that the, it, it, I think schooling nowadays maybe is is more anxiety producing than maybe it used to be, mm -hmm. and even it's even said that twenty percent of our students, uh, you know, are, are in in a form of anxiety that for some they they seek out, um, you know. Um, chemicals to yes. balance out. But one of the things that we've been encouraging at this university over the last number of years is, in fact, ta having students take um, what's called uh, a, a simple course in mindfulness meditation. And what's wonderful about this particular approach to existence, it's not complicated. You don't have to learn a mantra. You don't have to go, not that things like that aren't wonderful, but you don't have to sort of like, you know, spend 20 years up, up on a mountain somewhere before right. you do it. It's something that can be learned in five or six hours, maybe even less. And mindfulness meditation is allowing you to be part of the awareness of what's going on rather than just be into what's going on. And so one of the aspects of mindful meditation is it's not like you're trying to get the tough times to go away. It's, it, it's not that at all. It's to be able to recognize that you are the awareness of the tough times. And that itself gives you a perspective that means you're not just trapped in the prison of the tough time. You're also the awareness of being in tough time. And what you also do in mindfulness meditation is you also get to uh, learn, and not it's not very difficult, to not be attached to the particular problem. It's not to deny the problem. The problem's there. Absolutely, it's there. But it's for you to, you know, recognize the problem, that, you know, maybe to be even aware of where the problem came from. Um, and not you're not trying to solve it at this moment. It's just true. But also know that you are, you are non-attached from it. Who you are is also the observer of the problem. You are the consciousness and awareness of the problem. And when you are able to get to that space, it is a calming space. Sure. And freedom, I would think, arises. And then you could probably see the situation from a whole new viewpoint as opposed to being right trapped in it. Yes, I believe that's true. 
Maybe that's true. And and as I said, it's what's wonderful is it's it's and we're we're watching that with lots of students now who are just doing these mindfulness meditation um, you know training, and it's clear that it is helping them not be victims of themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also one of the you know the gifts of something like a through death experience is to also recognize yes these are all the problems we're facing and they're all difficult and they're all challenging. But we are not just the person facing those challenges. We are also a, a higher consciousness that is, you know, doing the dance of the challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, we're um, so much more. Jeremy, can we talk about your book a little bit? I've been reading sure. it this morning. And uh, something I love about it is not just your story, but I've interviewed quite a few people who've had near-death experiences. And one thing they say so many times is, Gosh, you know, I, I can't really tell you about it. It's so hard to put into words. And that's frustrating because, you know, I want to hear. <laughs> yeah. But what you do is you've painted 200 paintings. And it's your experience that when I'm looking at your experience while I'm reading it, 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 gives, it just shines a little light on what that, it, it gives me more of a detail of what that experience was like. So I think it's awesome, awesome yeah, that you've you. done that. You know, when I first had the experience, literally days, three days afterwards, and actually, actually, the, the morning afterwards, I wrote down everything that I, I had remembered. Um, and as I told you, that you know, three days later, I had this other, you know, sh- you know, shock of, oh wow, that happened too. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, I kind of put it aside, and then was looking for uh, over the years a way to share it because when I would tell it to people, um, I would realize this is something of value because. In sharing this, realizing that you know some of us get so attached to our careers, and sometimes we get so attached to certain relationships, and realizing that we are more than that. And not that we shouldn't care about those relationships or our careers, but that we are more than that. That's not just who we are. So I felt, okay, I, I want to communicate this. I want to share it. So I attempted to write um, um, a kind of a, a nonfiction narrative of what this was about, which which is what I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't particularly, it was dense, and, and I don't think it was particularly effective. And, you know, you, you know and in between shooting uh, pictures, I would, you know, go back to it and try again, and, which I did again. And then I thought, you know what, maybe I should make it into a fiction story. And so I wrote it up as a, a fictional story, you know, and, and did that. But I also felt it wasn't that effective. And then, uh, it was about, you know, I guess maybe five years ago, or maybe four years ago, I started to do some drawings. Now, I'm a graphic artist and, a, and a, a caricaturist in terms of the kind of art that I do. And as I started to make some drawings, it became very effective. I thought, wow, this is really, you know, yes, we've all heard it. A picture's worth a thousand words. This is really a good way to do it. And then, luckily, technology became a really ally. Because um, Photoshop, for those of your, 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 your listeners to sort of play with these materials, and particularly the iPad, mm-hmm. there were some very sort of simple and, and user-friendly um, programs that allowed me to make drawings rather swiftly. Um, and I then made this conclusion, oh, this is the way to communicate this particular experience and then I began to do you know many many drawings and, and paintings and and that became I felt a, a, a much more personal and yet more accessible way for the reader viewer to get what I went through so it was a, a, a kind of and also was a lot of fun to be honest with you I oh really, I bet it was I, I really have... enjoyed making them and they're you know and some of them I think you know I'm, I look at some of them I think oh, that's, a, that's a pretty cool little drawing and others you know at least it, it expresses the idea and I think it really does add to the way you can experience this particular journey because I think it's in many ways more fun just to be able to see and listen when I grew up when I grew up with comics I, I spent the time looking at the images and less time reading the balloons above them. So this is a continuation of that for me. That's right. I'm just visualizing the picture that you have, the painting that you have of um, when you said everything that happened in your life, every experience oh, yeah. was there all at once. And you've got a, a, a painting of that. And it's like, oh, it's wow. And then even when you traveled back through the universe, 
to the earth and to California and back into your body. I mean, just through pictures, I, I felt it. Yeah, it's an well, awesome thing. That's great. That's great to hear. You know, in that particular drawing, which is, it's a picture of this where sort of, as I was saying, I experienced everything at the same time that everything that this particular mind had experienced. And, and I remember there, I, I don't know, there, there are literally thousands, I think, of, of little images in that particular image because it was, um, you know, such an intense sort of experience. And, and, I, and that one took a long time. That was an earlier one that I actually created because, and again, because of Photoshop and, uh, you know, it allows you to grab images and then put them in other images. And then that's sort of what it became. But it was, it was definitely, Definitely, a, I think, a more expressive way of, of, of sharing this particular experience. Mm -hmm. Well, great job. Um, I'm looking at the time. It's gone by awfully quickly. Okay. We're, we're rounding up the end. Do you, first of all, how can people get in touch with you? Is the website I said correct? Yeah, the website is, I mean, you have to spell my name, um, but it's, it's, the website is the near death and life of, and Jeremy is J-E-R-E-M-Y, Jeremy, and the last name is K-A-G-A-N, and so that WhatsApp is there, and I think there's, on the website, there is a way to contact me um, at the, uh, so if, if anyone wants to do that, and um, I purposely, you know, when I, when I did write this and then uh, got contacted by Balboa Press to, uh, to, to um, uh, get it out there, I wanted it to be available to anybody who wanted to have the experience. And, you know, I think it costs $2.99. Yes, it does. <laughs> and it was meant to be cheap. So, that the, and, uh, unfortunately, in our society, if we give it away free, no one would take it seriously. So, so the $3 <laughs> is as serious as I feel you need to do. But if people are interested in actually seeing and experiencing this particular thing, if you do um, either, you, you can actually just go to, you know, online and just type in My Death, uh, a personal guidebook, and it'll come up uh, and you could you know, buy it and I would suggest if anybody does want to do that that you get the PDF version I mean you can get it for Kindle and iPads and all the rest but the PDF version is sort of a much more I think uh, accessible way of looking particularly at some of the imaging and you can make them big whereas on the iPads you can only do the size that it, it sends anyway but the, you know if you go to uh, you know My Death a Personal Guidebook online uh, it'll take you right to where you could uh, get the um, a piece and there's actually, I did a, a, a local TEDx version, uh, and if you do go to the website, the, the Near Death and Life of Jeremy Kagan, um, there is a five-minute video that includes some of the um, uh, images as well as a summation of some of the experiences, which I think is a, a, a good a taste of what this particular journey was about. Mm, it was great to watch that video too. And for me, I've seen you and now just to hear your voice and just, you're very loving, wonderful, easy to love man, Jeremy. Oh, thank you. You really do embody love and, and I'm thrilled. I am thrilled to have talked to you. And for our listener too, if you go to wedontdieradio.com and check out episode 84, that is Jeremy Kagan's episode and right on there links to his book, um, to just everything we've talked about, just to make it easy and to the near death and life of jeremykagan.com. So it's all housed there at one site as well as lots of other great episodes, of course, for you to listen to. Jeremy, any closing words or bits of advice if you could instill one thing in us, I don't know, deep in, <laughs> deep, go deep in and, and just whatever comes to mind. Anything you want to leave us with with final thoughts? Well, um, I, okay, I'll, 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 I'll quote myself. Okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> we have a choice, uh, you know, to be at one with anything that's happening and to know we are on an endless ride that bounces in and out from concrete time and space to the infinite and that we have a choice to deeply delight in the unending nows. What a gift. And so when I and when you come to the, our end, I hope it comes to all of us as a friend. And I wish everybody a remarkable ride. Mm, that's beautiful. Just beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, Jeremy. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah, I'm excited to go back and watch some of your movies, too, now that I know the man behind them. 
We'll, we'll look forward to shot in the next six months. Yes, definitely. We'll definitely share that too. And for our listener, thank you for spending this hour with us. I hope it's been of value. I know it sure has been for me. And just a reminder to go to we don't die radio.com and if you feel so interested, join the Insiders Club where you can read a complimentary copy of my book and get a bunch of other really great free things. So in closing, this is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe with all my heart that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So delight in the unending nows, as Jeremy Kagan said, and thank you for listening and we'll see you soon.